<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to James Franklin's weekly press conference. Just a reminder to turn your cell phones to vibrate off or mute. We'll start with an opening statement from Coach and then we'll go to Rich Garcelle. So appreciate you guys coming, uh, both both online um, as well as in person. Um, a couple things just to cover with you guys based on the previous game. Um, you know, we won the turnover battle. We talk about the most important stats that we study each week. We won the penalty battle, uh, not necessarily in the number of penalties, but yards, which it didn't necessarily feel that way to me, but it did play out that way. Drive start battle, we won sack battle, and we won the explosive play battle. Uh, we did not reach our goal, um, you know, on offense, but we did. But we did win the overall battle. When you talk about players of the game uh, on offense, we had Katron Allen uh, and Nicholas Singleton as the, the players of the game. On defense, we went with the defensive line: uh, Kozia, Izard, Beeman, Durant, Elise, Mustafer, Tarbert, and Isaac. Vanover and Robinson and Dennis Sutton. Obviously, when you break the all-time tackles for a loss record uh, at Penn State, it's hard not to, to make sure that you give those guys some love. They earned it and deserved it. On special teams, uh, Jake Pinnaker, you know, Jake Pinnaker. So uh, those were players of the game. And then the D squad players of the game. Uh, on offense, um, we had Caden Saunders, Jim Fitzgerald, on defense, we had Devon Townley and Keon Wiley, and then on special teams, Jace Tuddy. Um, you talk about general positives. Uh, I thought the kickoffs and field goals, you know, we were seven of seven uh, when it comes to either extra points or field goals. Number 12 was gonna be a factor in the game, so we really were able to limit his impact as a kickoff returner. Uh, I thought we had a ton of guys at this time of the year, it's just kind of the nature of, of football got a bunch of guys with bumps and bruises or sprains and we got a bunch of guys that really have battled through that um, and you know I wanted to make sure you know that we made a big deal out of that because it's been pretty impressive uh, from the coaches staff I thought our next man in mentality was really good which we needed it we already talked about six sacks and 16 tackles for a loss one and oh mentality moving on controlling the things that we can control our sudden change defense has been really impressive all season. I think we're 70 percent, um, 70 percent, seven out of 10 drives have resulted in zero points. And some of those, as you guys know, those sudden change situations have been backed up in our own territory. So that's been really big. And then conversely, our backed up offense has been really good. 67 percent of our drives starting inside the 10 yard line have gone for at least two first downs, which has allowed us to flip the field. So those have been real positives. And then I thought we made a big improvement on third down. We jumped 11% um, over the last two games in third down efficiency. Opportunities for growth, we got to continue to emphasize start fast, and then we got to eliminate the pre-snap and the post-snap penalties. One last thing that I thought I would share with you, because I thought it was interesting, and I hope you guys do. Uh, from the Indiana game. It was towards the end of the game, and I don't remember it specifically. It may have been during a timeout or, or something, but towards the end of the game. And the chain, uh, the chain uh, gang guy was, was talking to me. And typically, you guys don't get to know those personalities. They're pretty much the same guys, just like here at Penn State. We've had guys that have probably been doing it for 30 years. And this guy's trying to talk to me. And he's saying, you know that? You know what's funny? And I'm, I'm kind of giving them that like body language demeanor, like I really don't want to get into a conversation with you, um, you know, during the game. Um, but he doesn't read my body language and he says it again. You know what's really funny? And I, and I kind of turn and he goes, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor of a church. So now I have to listen, right? Um, he goes, I'm a pastor of a church and two years ago you were here and you were talking on the sideline about don't score, don't score, don't score. And I've never heard a coach in 30 years talk about not scoring. And then when you go on the field, you're screaming, don't score, don't score, don't score. Um, and then you score, and obviously you know how it plays out uh, over time and, and how the game plays out. And he goes, but I've used that in my sermon, I don't know how many times. And I'm like, I still don't really understand what he's talking about. 
And what he says is what, what, what may look good in this moment may not be the right thing for you, you know, down the road. So finally, kind of the message kind of comes, um, you know, but it was just an interesting interaction after all these years. I've never really had that kind of conversation and during the game. Um, but, um, but it was an interesting interaction that I had with this gentleman on the sideline uh, talking about a situation that I really didn't really want to talk about or remember, but he did bring it up and had a message about how he's used it in his church. Um, moving on to Maryland. Um, obviously, you guys know I've known Mike Loxley for a long time. We've been on the same staff at the University of Maryland for a number of years. Um, he's done a really good job there uh, of improving their program and, and their roster. Uh, their offensive coordinator, Dan Enos. Um, I don't know Dan as well, but obviously he's got a tremendous resume, five years of head coaching experience, uh, 11 years of offensive coordinator experience. Uh, and has really done a nice job there, you know, with their offense. Obviously, it's a combination of him and Mike Loxley, uh, but has done a nice job. You know, players on offense—they got a running back that we got a ton of respect for, redshirt freshman Roman Hemby, um, who's a local kid for them. Uh, Antoine Little Littleton uh, is a big back, uh, six foot, two hundred thirty-five pounds. There's reports out there that at one point he was two ninety or two sixty-five. He's lost a ton of weight. Has been very productive for them. Rakim uh, Jarrett is obviously a guy that we recruited, was a highly, highly recruited young man. Um, and then uh, Talia, I think everybody knows kind of his story, transferring from, from Alabama, and it seems like he's been playing there for a long time and has done a really good job for them. And then we've been impressed with Delmar G uh, Glaze, an offensive tackle, the right tackle, number 74, and then a tight end from Pennsylvania, uh, C.J. Dupree. So those guys jump out. On defense, Brian Williams is a guy I've known for a long time, their defense coordinator. I think he's doing a really good job. He was the defensive coordinator at Godby High School. When I was at Vanderbilt, we went in there and recruited an awesome young man by the name of Jakari Thomas, um, who played who played for Coach Williams at Godby High School. Um, and I think, uh, I think Brian Williams is doing a really good job with their defense right now. Guys that kind of stand out to us um, is their defensive tackle, number 33. Uh, Nasili uh, Kite, um, cornerback number two, uh, Chikorian Bennett, um, who I actually think played junior college football with Mitch Tinsley, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, middle linebacker number one, Jay Sean Barham, is a young man that we recruited very hard. Uh, was playing really well for them as a true freshman. And then defensive tackle number 54, uh, Ami Finau, as a defensive tackle. And then on special teams, uh, James Thomas, um, guys that stand out for us you know, on special teams. James has been on the staff there, was an analyst that got promoted from within, has done a nice job. Uh, their punt returner, Tarheeb Still, who's a local kid from New Jersey. Uh, like kick returner number 15, Octavian Smith. And then they have a kicker that I think transferred in, but he's a Pennsylvania kid from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. We transferred in is doing a really nice job for them. So uh, that's my overall notes. Uh, uh, happy and, and looking forward to opening up the questions. Go to Rich Garcelle, Rennie Eagle, and then we'll go to Mike Gross. Hey, Rich. Hey, Having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. How, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm really good, thanks. Um, I'd like to ask you a few more questions about uh, the offensive line. Yeah. On uh, Hunter Norris had a decision this morning, or announced this morning, about returning for 2023. Um, what kind of boost is that for next year, and how has he played? And also, can, can you give us any update on Olu and Landon? Yeah, so um, the first part about Hunter, um, as you know, I think I may have mentioned it, but I think you know I've been having these meetings. Um, on Sundays, especially Sundays of home games when a lot of the families are in town anyway, um, sit down and talk. So I had a meeting with Hunter and his mom and his sister uh, a few weeks back and had a really good conversation. And I was sitting in my office, I think it was yesterday, and he just came walking in and had a couple questions for me, wanted to ask me. Um, and at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, I I'm staying. 
I think there's a lot of things that, that, that I want to do here at Penn State and I want to finish in my career. Um, you know, I think the other thing is he's going to finish his master's degree, which is, which is awesome. Um, you know, and I think, you know, he's got really high expectations of what he can do and we can do. So I think that'll be great. Uh, but that's, that's really all it was. He's obviously, we've had a conversation. He's been getting asked a question. So he just kind of wanted to, you know, answer the question and then be able to kind of move on and not, not be, you know, continue to get asked the question for the rest of the season. Um, Landon. Uh, Landon, I did speak with Landon. You know, as you guys know, I won't really call and talk about injuries unless I've talked to the young men first about it. Landon did have surgery uh, and will be out for the remainder of the year. Um, and, and Olu is one of those situations where it's week to week, and uh, I won't I won't get into the kind of the details and specifics of that. I think, you know, especially for the for the uh, media that has been covering us, you know, for a while and consistently and regularly know, know how we handle those things. But, uh, but Landon, Landon will be done for the year. Mike Gross, look at your newspapers, then Donnie Collins. Hey, Mike. Hey, James, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, a couple of things about Katron and Nick. Um, it, it, uh, it looks to me like the last couple of weeks in particular, Nick, has improved in some of the areas that Katron was really good at almost from the jump, uh, making people miss and vision and, and using your blockers, et cetera. Uh, so uh, do you agree with that? And if so, is the explanation just more reps or, or something other than that? And then the other thing is people talk about freshmen hitting the wall around this time of year. And do you think that's a real thing? And if it is, doesn't seem to be bothering them. Uh, so, um, can you mitigate it? Is there anything you can do about it? Yeah, so first of all, I don't know if I would make the comparison the way you did, but to answer part of your question, yeah, I think Nick is getting better every single week. I think both of those guys are running really physical, and, and Nick had some really good runs where, you know, maybe there was three or four yards and he turned them into six or seven yard runs. Um, but yeah, he's getting more comfortable and getting more confident every single week, um, every single practice, every single game. Uh, and so is Katron. They're, they're both getting better in, in areas that they need to improve. And as you can imagine, there's still a ton of growth for both of them um, you know, based on the fact that they're true freshmen and, and haven't played a whole lot of football. You know, back to your other point about you know, young players you know, hitting the wall, I think, you know, that's that's where kind of the rotation is important. So hopefully, you know, getting Keevon back, you know, would help with that. Um, but being able to rotate two backs, it kind of limits that, um, you know. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a factor, there's no doubt about it. But I do think if you're playing with one guy all the time, then the likelihood of that happening kind of increases and, and we're not doing that. Now, I also know, if they're not on the field, then then you guys are going to be asking me tough questions about why they're they're not on the field. Uh, but then now I can use your um, hitting the freshman wall uh, example of mitigating that as the reason why. So I appreciate you asking. Donny Collins, Grand Times Tribune, then Corey Geyer. How you doing, James? Good. How are you? Doing well. Uh, kickoffs and kickoff placement were kind of a topic of discussion in the first half of the season, and then Jake is obviously settled that down a little bit. Uh, why did you guys put him in when you did uh, if, uh, on kickoffs? How has he improved there? And is this something he, because his percentage is pretty high on, on touchbacks. Is this something you guys knew he could do uh, for the last couple of years? And you know, or, or how has he improved there in, in, in that regard? Yeah, he, he's doing really well. And I appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, he's, he's doing really well. I think, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, I thought that was a big factor in the game. You know, number 12, as you guys know, their head coach was talking about him all week long and the impact that he could have on the game and trying to get him touches. So being able to kick it out was funny. I was talking to Jake a couple times after his kicks when I kind of jogged down and kind of congratulated him doing a good job. I guess number 12 was like talking trash to him the whole time, like kick it to me, you know, kick it to me. You're scared to kick it to me, going back and forth. Um, so I think that was a major factor. You know, it's interesting. You know, with, with Jake, early on, um, when he was 
focused on on field goals only. He was not great at kickoff, and we were trying to get him uh, to do both. And I know he's got aspirations, like all these guys do, to continue playing. And most of those guys are going to have to do two jobs, whether it's field goal and kickoff or punt and kickoff. You got you got to try to bring a little bit more value there. Um, and he really embraced it and worked like crazy in the offseason. Obviously, with Stout going, because Stout was elite at that. With Stout moving on, there was an opportunity and a need there. We'd like to specialize, you know, whenever we can, but it just was obvious that, that Jay could handle both and, and has done a really nice job in both areas. But you would not have said that, you know, two, three years ago. He's really worked hard at it and gotten good at it. Corey Geiger, Pittsburgh Sports, then Ben Jones. James. How are we doing? Did you have a chance to go 10 and 2? Does, does he have a southern accent right now? He does. He, he always does. does. Yeah, he always does. We're in Arkansas. Arkansas. Oh, I didn't know that. It just seemed extra strong right there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a chance to go 10 and 2 and get to a New Year's 6 6 game. Uh, a strong case could probably be made that your team is even better than maybe people think. But at the same time, you don't have what people would consider a signature win yet. So I'm curious as a coach, what you think about the concept of the signature win and how the public latches on to that kind of thing when they're evaluating a team. Yeah, I, I, obviously there, there's value in it, right? It's interesting because you got some teams and some programs um, that have not been consistent, but have big time wins. Um, and then you have others that have been consistent, but but not the signature win. And obviously what you want is you want both, right? You want you want the consistency week in and week out, which I think we've all seen um, you know, is hard to do. And the signature wins are, are hard to do. And what you're trying to do is, is try to do both. You know, that's that's what the, the you know the best programs in college football are able to do. Um, I, I don't know if I would necessarily say consistently, but yes, they're that's what the best programs in college football are attempting to do. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a fair point. Obviously, we want the same thing, um, you know. But most importantly, you know, we got to be one and zero this week, or people will be complaining about the other part of it too. So we just we, we got to do what we got to do this week to be one and zero. Continue to stack wins and stack days and, and be positive. Give you guys positive things to write about, and then hopefully at the end of the season we're where we need to be and. Put ourselves in the best position possibly uh, for the bowl season as well as momentum going into the next season. But yeah, I think obviously you, you want both. Ben Jones, statecollege.com, and then John McConnell. Hey, James, how's it going? Good, how are you, Ben? Good, my time power went out in the middle of all this, so I'm on my phone. That's very exciting. Um, it, actually, it actually just broke up while you were saying that. <laughs> all right, well, we'll see if this question's any good against you. But um, Christian Bayou. How is he sort of handled this season? I would say it's sort of unique because I think there's a certain amount of telegraphing about how this ought to all pan out in the end. And certainly maybe the conversations in the last building are different than the ones that, that seem to be going on in front of everybody else. But how does he handle this? How do you handle that? And how do you sort of prepare for whatever happens over the next couple of months? Yeah, he's been phenomenal. He really has. I think that whole quarterback room has been great. I think Sean has kind of set the tone for that that whole room. Uh, but but Christian has been phenomenal. You know, th those are tough conversations and tough decisions that have to be made. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because I've, I've I've kind of used this with the players before. You know, you look at some players that may play as a true freshman and play well, and another guy redshirts and they're in the same class. And then you look three years down the road and the guy that redshirted ends up having what people would describe as maybe a better career. So it's just, you know, there's a lot of twists and turns along these journeys. Um, but I think I think Bay, Bayer has been phenomenal. His attitude has been great. He's been great in meetings. He's totally engaged. We've been rotating those guys down to the scout team. They've been awesome down there. Um, he's been great. Body language, his demeanor, his leadership, his attention to detail, the way he's preparing as if he was the starter has been really good. So, um, you know, th those types of things, specifically at those positions, I think are really important. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. But, 
Uh, you know, I hope he, he stays at Penn State and continues to chase his dream and, and gets his degree and, and see how it all plays out. Because again, there's a lot of twists and turns along these journeys. Um, and you know, and it, there's part of me that, that it breaks my heart a little bit about the conversations and the things that you're having now in college football that you didn't used to have. But I also, as you guys know, I also, you know, understand this is where we're at and kind of embrace it. And there's really, there's there's good in both, right? There's good, so there's a lot of good things that I believe existed in the old model. And there's a lot of good that exists in the new model. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily the same things though. Johnny McGonagall, Penn Live, and then we'll come into the room. Hey James, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, uh, yeah going back to Landon, you know, before the injury, uh, how would you evaluate how he developed uh, you know, from spring into camp and then into those five games uh, that he started at guard? Yeah, he's playing really well. As you know, you know, Landon is, seems like he's been a part of our program forever. You know, he's looked just like he looks right now since like third grade when he first started coming to camp at Penn State. Um, he made it pretty obvious that this is where he always wanted to be. Um, he was great during the recruiting process. He was he was high production and low maintenance, and you can't have enough of those guys in your organization, whether that's players or staff. And um, and he's been productive. I mean, you think about him, he's he's started and played well at guard, well enough for us to win. He started and played at tackle well enough for us to win. Um, he's been a great teammate. He's been a great student. He's been a class act both on and off the field. I think he's got a very, very bright future. You know, obviously, you, you hate these types of setbacks and, and disappointment. It is part of the game. Um, we do seem to have a little bit more of them you know, right now than, than we've had maybe in, in, in other years. Maybe in other years we've had them you know, at certain positions with certain players that have, have made it maybe a little bit more attention on it. Um, but, but we seem to have a number of these right now. And, Landon's, Landon's attitude has been, been phenomenal, and the team's attitude about next man in has been really good. I do think, I remember talking to Trout and Frank Leonard, you know, it happening, you know, in pregame right before the game. I do think that that was something that we needed to learn from that something like this may happen, and we got to respond and respond quickly. And I don't know if we necessarily did with his initially. James, you've been down three starters on the O line, and some guys further down the depth chart have been banged up as well. Can you address the job that Phil has done, kind of juggling all of the different pieces to actually field a line, and not only field a line, but have a productive line in the last couple of games? Yeah, I think it's it's probably been you know, understated, you know, by me. Um, and part of that is, is strategy a little bit, um, you know, with with who we're playing and them knowing exactly what we're doing. Um, that's played a that's played a part in it. Um, but yeah, I think he's he's done a phenomenal job. You know, Phil's done a great job. Frank's done a great job. I think Mike has done a really good job in the way he's called the game and understand there's some things that we got to do going in the last week where we're going to have to tweak and change how we call the game to to put those guys in the best position as possible. Whether that's running the ball a little bit more, whether that is moving the pocket a little bit more. Excuse me. <coughs> Whether that is uh, chipping you know, with tight ends and, and running backs to, to try to help those guys, uh, all, all those types of things, max protect, whatever, whatever it may be. But yeah, I think, I think we've done a nice job under, under you know, really challenging circumstances. Um, you know, starting a true freshman you know, in the Big Ten um, you know, at left tackle. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of credit to, to the staff. I think there's a lot of credit to the players. I thought Olu did a really good job being the left tackle coach last week. Um, I thought Drew Shelton has really prepared all season. He's another one of those freshmen in this class that I've talked to you guys about that has been very intentional about how he's worked, been very mature, um, you know, and, and really from a very early point when he arrived on campus, we, we thought he had a chance to be pretty good. So and we'll, we'll see how it all plays out. You know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll have Caden back this week, which, which would really help. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how those things play out. At the end of the day, we're going to do whatever we've got to do to be 1-0 this week. 
um, but there's still the possibility of us be, maybe being able to redshirt some of these guys if we can, but that won't trump what we have to do this year and this season to, to be successful. James, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing good, thanks. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, with Langdon after the year, we've seen Hunter get banged up, we've seen Sal get banged up, and you just mentioned, you know, redshirt again. How does Langdon's injury and those guys being banged up impact guys like Vega and JP the rest of the way? Yeah, so, so Vega's a guy that we are preparing in practice every single week to play. Um, you know, uh, JB's a guy that we're preparing. You know, JB's a guy that we're not only preparing at left guard, we're also preparing at left tackle. He played tackle in, in high school. Um, you know, so we did that all last week as well. Obviously, getting Caden back helps. You know, and then, and then there's also, you know, the discussion about how many games left that they have available. So that do you play Vega now this week to get him one game and then shut somebody else down to try to manage it as much as you can again, but not so much so that it, it limits your ability to be effective and explosive and, and, and you know, be one and oh. So, so we'll see how that plays out this week. Um, you know, we thought we were going to have Caden back for last week. Didn't play out that way. So you never totally know. Um, you know what you're trying to do is preparing for worst case scenario and and hoping for you know, slightly above that, if not best case scenario. Nope. Hey James, how are you? Sorry. Hey James, I want to ask you, um, how did you and the staff this year, um, I guess this week, uh, approach voting with the um, players? And is there anything that's built in the schedule today that um, give them the opportunity to do so if they haven't already? No, we, we promoted it, not just, you know, this week, but really for the last couple of weeks, um, you know, we talked about the importance of it, and getting out and doing it. Um, I know, you know, in years past, uh, there was some conversation about shutting this day down. And, you know, I think once everybody kind of looked at it, it, it didn't totally make sense. As you know, you have from seven in the morning till eight at night. So there's time to do it. Um, I'm actually going after the, after this, we have a staff meeting morning at 7, so it's, it's hard to do it then, uh, but I'm, I'm going to go after this and do it. My wife already went this morning. Uh, so just promote it as much as we can, the importance of it um, for whatever your beliefs are, for where, whatever you stand on things that, you know, um, you know, people have lost their lives and made tremendous sacrifices for you to have the ability to, to vote um, and not to take that right for granted. So we just, we talk about it as much as we can as we do a lot of social issues um, and promote it, you know, at, but at the end of the day, you gotta, you gotta be able to go do it. James. Afternoon, James. How we doing? Doing good. Um, you touched on Drew Shelton a little bit, uh, a couple of questions ago, but what have you seen from him specifically in practice to kind of know that you have a, a true freshman who, who's ready to start at left tackle in the Big Ten? What were you seeing uh, out of him over these past few weeks? Well, he's a unique, like, COVID recruiting story. You know, um, literally, I think one of the first tape we got on him was him blocking his sister in the backyard. Um, you know, didn't have tape. He's got a sister who's tall. I think she's actually got a volleyball scholarship. Um, and literally, he's in the backyard pass setting, you know, with, with his sister. And she won a few reps, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> But that was kind of one of them weird COVID deals where you're trying to get information and, um, you know, it kind of went from there. But then afterwards, you know, um, he ended up transferring high schools and then transferring back. And, you know, we had a really strong relationship with his mom and his sister. Um, and we were able to kind of weather, you know, that storm of the recruiting process. And then from that point on, he's been, he's been phenomenal. Our strength coaches very early on had identified him as a guy they were really excited about in terms of his work ethic and demeanor and approach. Um, the veteran players were kind of talking about him. The coaches, once we were able to get into training camp and start meeting with him and teaching football, he's a smart guy, he's a mature guy. You know, so he's been preparing all season kind of for his opportunity and, you know, there's been a lot of discussions in college football over the years about just going to a five-year model where everybody just has five years. And if he was, you know, he would have played a ton already this year. 
Um, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it all plays out, but he just, he's a guy that checks a lot of boxes in terms of intelligence and maturity and athleticism and body type. And his high school went down in town here in Pennsylvania, did a great job with him. Uh, he spent some time at IMG, they did a nice job with him as well. Um, but, you know, he's just, he's been a guy that's, you know, really been kind of steady, eddy, and consistent the entire time. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's got a really high ceiling and a, and, a low, and a high floor, to be honest with you. AJ, that's my hometown. You're shouting out there in Downingtown. Where'd you go to high school? Downingtown is the other one. Um, but going along with all the injuries and the contingency plans that you guys have hit, Kobe King played a really nice game on Saturday. Um, how do you think maybe that can help propel him forward? And do you hope that maybe you'll have Curtis and Elspeth this week or either of them? Yeah, so um, so when it comes to Kobe, you know, really good. He's been playing all year long. Um, 